Uh, good morning, everyone. Starting very promptly, one minute early. Uh, first of all, good morning. Thank you for being here. Um, uh, my name is Rob. We're going to be doing a talk, or I'm going to be doing a talk today, uh, Cracking the Code, um, Lessons from Our Success. Um, very quickly, a little bit about me. Um, this is me. Um, I've worked in the music industry for nine years before my life at Filtered um, in various different roles in terms of managing uh, artists, going into organizations, talking about digital fluency, digital transformation, doing face-to-face -face learning, online learning, webinars, coaching, um, the lot, um, and also digital marketing for artists. So not just teaching people how to do things, but then doing it for big acts. Um, and then uh, through one of the co-founders, Vinit, um, I decided to come and work at Filtered. Uh, at the moment, my role is head of custom success, so it's hopefully apt that we are talking about success and you have someone who's at least got it in their role. Um, and what that means, if any of you don't know what custom success is, is similar to an account manager, where we will, once someone has come in and become a client, we are working with them to align what our platform does or what our tool does to their goals, whether that is getting people to learn more, to be able to try and put an ROI around learning um, to be able to just engage people. That generally is where the success team will come into. And obviously, we'll be very transparent and the more successful we are with the client, the more successful we become as a business. So it's, it's very clear. Talking about our clients, um, here's a quick screen grab of some of our clients that we currently work with. Um, big companies, you know, FTSE 100s all the way to small charities. Um, so we try and cross multiple sectors. What we do transfers to all of these clients. There's nothing that really, um, don't tell the bigger clients that, that we don't do for the smaller clients, that we do for the big ones. The stuff that we're going to talk about, the data we're going to show you is provided to everybody. It's just whether you interpret it and make use of that. Um, very, very quickly, if anyone is not familiar with Filtered, I must say this now, otherwise the guys at the back will have my guts, is we're at stand one. Um, we have kind of rebranded, so if you're expecting to see different logos, uh, this is caught, you, you can see it's very black and you can see we're at stand one around there. Just in case anyone's confused and you think you're not in the right place, you are. Um, so we're going to cover, or try to cover, and I had to make sure I pulled this from the sort of blurb on the... Uh, brochure that you got, just to make sure we're both aligned. Um, how to give L&D a bigger voice in your organization, make pilots a success, or make a full roll rollout. I've seen lots of talk recently. I even screen grabbed um, a, a, a conversation on Monday from various people on Twitter talking about the biggest people, biggest issue people have or that work within L&D is not having enough either power, influence, or a voice to really affect change. So can we help you do that? I think Based on some clients, I think we can. We had a fantastic uh, event yesterday with some of our clients. Uh, Procter & Gamble were talking about how we have helped them at least make database decisions which go against what function leaders want to do. How to apply digital marketing techniques to learning in global companies. Um, I think one of the things I really find is we create great learning, but you need to make sure people want to learn. So how do we understand those motivations, those drivers? What tactics can we use or, or effectively steal from a digital marketing um, environment and apply them to LND? Some data, so when people, learn, uh, when people use learn, that doesn't make sense, but why people learn, what they use, what formats they prefer, what skills they like to look at. Um, very, very important into your overall strategy for LND. What happens when organizations put their competency frameworks to the test? I'll show some quick slides um, about that. And data-driven decisions, increasing engagement, um, a lot to cover. I speak very quickly, as you've probably already uh, established. So if you do want me to slow down, just wave. Um, I will, if you want to ask a question in, and sort of in between, just ask a question. Please just put your hand up. I will ask some questions at the very end, or at least um, open it up to you guys. So very quickly, I'm not going to talk too much about this, but the big problems that we see across those clients, but also sort of having our ear to the ground at LND is there's too much training content, there's bad data or a lack of insight, there's lots of technology, little time, wasted efforts and money, and small teams and big ambitions. Now, 
This is the audience participation part of it. Uh, if you could raise your hand if you experience all five of those things currently. Everyone's a bit shy, a couple people. Four things, three, two, is, is anyone here that doesn't agree with any of those points, just out of interest? No, okay, great. So we've, 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 like I say, we've kind of got the gauge of the room, hopefully. We will be running through some of this, but like I say, if anyone wants to talk about these in more depth, come grab us afterwards. Or if you have any questions in particular about these, do ask us um, after. So how can we address these problems? Um, we think... And this, can, this isn't just the solution, AI-driven personalization. It's how this helps you make those decisions um, to address five, those five problems. And I think the overall offering that I'll take you through and what we've been doing with various clients should hopefully make a bit more sense. We're not just going to throw someone at Spotify and all of a sudden all our problems are uh, solved. But this highlights what we kind of do. So for those of you that use Spotify, that Apple Music, Netflix, Amazon, you are all used to being recommended content. Recommended music, recommended what show to watch, recommended films. What we want to do is use that sort of consumer grade experience and recommend users learning. Not like Netflix where you want to waste an afternoon. We're not trying to waste people's time. We're trying to improve their skills gaps or plug those gaps that they currently have to effectively make people better at their job. So this is Magpie for anyone that hasn't used it or seen it. Um, there is an LND version freely available. If you want the URL, come to our stand or Lee over there with the big hair. He'll be able to tell you what the, uh, the URL is. Um, and you can go there and experience it yourself. It's free. It's got full of L&D content that's been curated specifically for you as an audience. Um, and what we do is we curate content from around a variety of different sources. These are public sources at the bottom. But when we work with other clients that have LinkedIn Learning, Get Abstract, Coursera, Skillpill, all these great content providers, we're not trying to cut anyone out. What we're going to do is pull them into one place and recommend the most relevant things to individuals. So we're not trying to send people in 15 different uh, learning places. We're trying to pull them into one. But most importantly, narrow down that content, curate that content very heavily, which are then effectively, as a learner, I can say, I want to improve my communication skills because I'm doing a presentation. Rather than being given a plethora of content, we're going to give you the best piece of content, that one thing that's actually going to elevate your performance. So that's sort of the, I would say, the very quick sales pitch. But what I'm actually going to talk about is now how this affects you guys. So this is why you're here. So we've got that bit out of the way. Hopefully, this is where it's going to be really interesting. Um, positioning. Now, what this means is how you position your learning. So us as a business, we don't work with, well, we do work with all clients, but we don't actually have competencies or, sorry, mandatory content within Magpie. Because we're trying to recommend people, if you need to do GDPR training or fire safety training, we can't recommend to you module 10 if you haven't done one, because one may mean that you miss out a key thing, how to you know, fire a fire extinguisher, for example. So what we do is we do self-directed, so continuous learning. So you come into the tool, and it's all about your own self-improvement. So the positioning of this is quite hard, because we're not saying to people, you must go and do your GDPR training. You must go and do this sales enablement training before you can perform an action. What we're doing is saying, this is great. We're not going to stop you from doing that. But what we want to do is make you a better employee, colleague, whatever you call them in your own business, performer to get the skills that you need to develop. And you can decide those as well. Now, what problems are we solving for the user? This is where it comes to those positioning. So because we are driving development where people are doing it themselves rather than forced. We've had to think really hard across businesses, and the positioning is different for every business. This isn't a copy and paste job, but these are the ones that transfer quite well across the majority of different clients we see. So one is maximize your learning time. If you are, we've done lots of focus groups with enterprise clients, and they'll say, I know that there is a really good piece of learning about how to do a specific task, but I can spend 20 minutes on SharePoint trying to find it, and I still don't find something. I can spend 20 minutes on the LMS and try and find something, and I've wasted 20 minutes of your time. So what we're trying to do is maximize your learning time by saying, this is the one thing, Rob, 
about leadership that you need to know because we understand the user a little bit. We've curated that content to know that's really good. Multiple content libraries in one place. Only the best curated content. Expansive user experience, and these are all just positions of how we position them to users. Similarly to how I have used Spotify for nine years now, my Spotify recommends me music better than my wife. I've been my wife for 11 years. A little bit questioning you know, who knows me best when Spotify can recommend me better music. But I've been my wife for 11 years, Spotify for nine. And Spotify is able to understand what music I like. If I start listening to jazz, for example, one month, it will change those recommendations for me and recommend me things that are similar. We will do a very similar thing. We understand that people change roles. We understand that people change priorities. I worked in customer success. I've, I've been doing it now for two and a half years. The scope of my clients has changed dramatically from smaller clients into more enterprise clients. So I have had to understand different things about procurement, about how to talk to people, how to talk to a stakeholder that manages a team of you know, thousands of people. So as your role expands, so do you. And then obviously, the other thing that you can pull people into your LMS, your LXP, your system, or whatever it is, is new features and new content. It's really easy. You know? Curate new content, create new content, which is a bit pricey, but curate content, or you have new features. And these are the five things that we find really provide people a reason to go back into the tool. Second one is use platforms you use. So Royal Mail, one of our clients, um, we email them the users that use this. So only people that have come in and created an account will get an email. We're not trying to spam everyone at Royal Mail saying come into our tool. We are activating our emails once they come into it. And we are able to curate content around what is going on in the business. So for example, we know Royal Mail, parcels, Christmas, December, Jesus Christ, it must be awful. Um, you've got lots of cars to deliver, lots of packages to deliver. So we know that, for example, that could be quite a stressful time to work, whether you are in management, finance, or you know, in fulfillment. You, we are picking assets that are going to be relevant to them at that specific time, at that need. So you might be stressed, so here's something to do with resilience. There might be lots of change going on in the organization, so here's something about change management. Now, in Royal Mail, it's a very much email-dominated um, workflow, so we're sending emails to them. For some clients, we've started to send text messages, um, which is, for us, really fascinating. We've done some user testing with Royal Mail. We asked hundreds of people, would you like SMS messages? They said very emphatically, no way. My phone is my phone. My email is my email. Work personal. We go and work with other healthcare providers, and they use their phone for everything. So they'd much prefer an SMS message, because email is locked into some really high secure uh, you know, patient confidentiality system, and an SMS about learning that's going to just say, hey, here's a reminder to log in, evades all of the sort of structure that we're trying to penetrate. So there, there are two quick things, positioning and using platforms that you use. And I mentioned email because email is still king across sort of all um, content providers. But there's also Slack. There's also Yammer. There's also Teams. All of these social communities that we're able to have contact with our learners are great opportunities to um, talk to people. So one of the points in those five points that we said we'd talk about is understanding when users learn or what they do. And this is a who wants to be a millionaire question. I'm showing my age here, really, I think. I don't think it's on anymore. If it is, Jeremy Clarkson's on it, so no one watches it. But across all Magpie clients, what time do users prefer to learn? Now, just a hand in the room, very quickly. There's going to be. I'm a, does anyone have a really good idea of when people learn across their whole organisation? Does any, or does anyone have an idea? You know, what time, what day? Not really. Okay, again, early on, so no one's too brave yet. So don't worry. I'm sure there are a few people that will know. Um, but we were able to track when people use the system. So across all Magpie clients, again, there's no wrong answer here. No one is going to get a million pounds, so there's no right answer either. But across Magpie clients in general, we have four options here. So if eight to 10, if you can just raise your hand if you think people generally in your organization learn more between eight and 10. OK, quite a few. 10 to 12, not so many. 12 to two, so lunchtime peak. And then uh, two to four. OK, so the, the majority of people, I would say, went for one of these two options on the left-hand side. So based on our data, 
again, to be able to track when people learn. We can go into clients and they generally say, we think people learn the most when they commute into work. Personally, that's probably when I learn the most. I listen to podcasts, majority of mornings. Some are football related, so not so much learning, but some are you know, more business related. So we're able to see when people learn. Now, it's great me showing you this, but what you probably want to see is a graph to sort of map how that does. So here is how we can look at what an average is across Magpie and across all of our clients, but also how it changes to you. So the red here is the Magpie average, and we're running up and down. And you can see, actually, there's not a huge difference between those left-hand options of 8 and 10 and 12 to 2. There's not really a huge difference. But when we spoke to this client, there is a massive difference of when people learn. We can talk to the HR team, we can talk to the LND team, discover why that may be, and then communicate to people more effectively. You know, it could be that you're sending emails on a Friday, and this was something that was shared yesterday at our event. Friday may be the most positive day that the senior leadership think that people learn. Realistically, it could be a Tuesday, it could be a Wednesday. It will be different for every organization. You will have an idea of your organization and when people learn. What we can do is, is sort of show you when people decide to learn. And again, the beauty of what we do is not the fact that it is going to be, this is when Rob does his GDPR training or his fire safety training or this mandatory training. This is actually when I want to go in and learn something that's gonna be beneficial to me for my own development. So when do I want to develop? Do I want to develop at 12 o'clock when I've just had a nice big lunch and I'm sort of getting over that food coma and just reading a few articles, watching some TED Talks? Or do I want to learn more on the way home? And understanding your users, your learners, um, is extremely important to be able to scope that delivery. The other thing here is what type of content they want to learn. Now, anyone that is uh, a provider um, or anyone here that is, you know, potentially works within an internal L&D team, you will be looking at content either to create new content yourself or to buy new content. Do you have a really good idea of what content people actually consume. So because we are platform agnostic or content agnostic, we'll pull in content from around different providers across different types of content and be able to paint a picture to you of what content really engages users. So for this client, again, we the just for example, the red is standard Magpie usage. The bars here are a, a client. This client's a FTSE 100 company, has lots of um, content has very, very little video content, they said to us, before we did this pilot with them. So what that meant was their video usage dominated learning because people, it was new, it was fresh. So we were able to go to them and say, actually, if you're going to put some money into new pilots of other systems, let's start to explore video more. Because we know that online courses, yeah, they're getting... We, we're not trying to kill the online course here. We know that there's a huge value in those. But for this just-in-time learning, or for someone to actually take advantage of their own time and their free time, what they're trying to do here is watch videos. And this changes for every client, and it depends on what you have. So it may be that you have Coursera, or you have lots of online courses where people are going to and trying to develop over a long amount of time. It could be that you have someone that is amazing at delivering webinars in your team, or there's a really strong webinar culture, and that is a lot higher. But we can provide you the data to be able to say, this is what people actually learn. How can we challenge the misconceptions or the understandings of what goes on in the business? The other thing that we find fascinating here is when we go to clients, a lot of clients think we create content, but it's not as good as HBR. It's not as good as a TED Talk. It's not as good as XYZ. What our uh, statistics prove across multiple clients, actually, is that the client the, the content that you create that has that raw male brand, that has the brand al assigned to you, gets a huge amount more engagement, double the engagement per asset than content that is not specialized to you. And it shows that it's great to look at free providers across the web, but actually if you can create content that is the royal male way of doing something or the your client way of doing something, then you're going to increase engagement, increase the relevancy of that to a user, and answer a lot more questions that people have. Now, there may be a way, for example, to run a meeting. At Filtered, we run meetings all the bloody time, just like any organization. Is there a way that we run meetings that are different to a different organization? Do you have to have intros at the beginning of a meeting? Do you have to have an outcome proposition? In some organizations, you do. In other organizations, you don't. 
We have one client that has a safety call at the beginning of every meeting. It, the first time I had it, it was terrifying. I didn't know what they were asking me. So that was something that is very different to the way that Filter conducts things. If you're reading not a generic online article, how do you prepare for that? So your own content is extremely valuable, but what we have done with this client and the majority of clients that I'm showing you here is curate the best of the best. We know that it could be that there is an article about leadership from HBR that's really, really good. It's going to be very hard for someone internal to have the gravitas that HBR has about leadership. So what we will do is we'll weigh it up and we'll say, actually, for this skill, HBR is better provider. This is better than the sources that you've created. But for other things, there'll be skills and items that your content that you create dwarfs any external provider. The other thing that we look at is usage alignment. So the huge beauty of the tool is the fact that we have a skills framework and we'll go into an organization and ask them to use their own. So we are going to allow you to uncover what skills people actually want to develop. Not what the business wants them to develop, but what they want to develop. It's all self-driven. We're recommending content to people and we can say, you know, leadership, communication generally across all organizations is very, very high. People want to either lead people better, want to be able to talk to people better. What we can see here though is, and this is a sort of a graph that has content usage on the left hand side. So the higher things are, the more content usage they've had. And then across the axes at the bottom, I always get X and Y confused, so I'm just going to say top and bottom. But the axis at the bottom, it, what you have here is how much content we have in the system that answers that is tagged to those skills. So we can see that for something like leadership, we're actually probably looking at quite well because we've got lots of content. It's further down here. We've got lots of usage. However, delivery and innovation, we don't have enough content for those two skills, yet there is a demand in the business. The usage is higher than that sort of static line going up. So when we're making our decisions and creating content, maybe we want to focus something on delivery and innovation. We work with one, uh, one of the big supermarkets. The big skill that people want to self-diagnose, what they want to do is, is growth mindset. So on this graph, growth mindset would literally be up here in the sky. But actually, the content provision that they have, they have very little content. So what we are doing now is we're curating from great assets from you know, Get Abstract, Coursera, TED, all these different places. And we're starting to curate content that will align with the need in the business that people want to explore growth mindset. Then obviously we have the bottom area at the very, is this a clicker? Yeah, bottom of the area just down there where we have probably an okay amount, but there's not a huge demand of what people want to learn. Now that's either really good, but if the key initiative in the business, for example, we want to become more innovative and this innov innovation is one of those content pieces down there and no one is looking at it, can we do a communication piece around that to sort of elevate the usage of that skill? Can we identify that actually the way that we've been communicating that in the business isn't that good? Or it's not sticking, that positioning isn't right. Can we analyze the data to then be able to go to the marketing team, go to the comms team, go to the L&D team and say, look, we are not getting the uptake in this skill that we want to drive in the business. Can we move the needle and move it further down the chart? The other thing that we have, and this is just a generic, I think this is from our L&D uh, version, is feedback usefulness. So um, you can do via skill, but you can also do via provider. So we have some clients, these are all, fr like this is for a completely free um, statistics here. So no one, these aren't client data just for the record and none of this has been paid for by a client. So we're not necessarily saying, right, future learn is a lot more useful than brain picking. So cut that brain picking's budget. But you can start to think about how you curate content and what sources you provide. We can go into a large provider and we had a case yesterday where we spoke, a large provider was talking to us and was able to say, I know that the fourth best provider in Magpie, I pay millions of dollars for, when actually one, two, and three, I don't spend anywhere near that. Do I have an issue here where I, that provider I can turn off and save lots of money? Or can I use that money to invest into those three, three providers that are already performing really well in the organization? So how do we use this data to, again, affect your learning strategy moving forward? So hopefully I've covered this, but this is a reminder just in case I haven't. How do you make the most of this data? You work with facts, not myths. So we can have a hunch, we can have a hypothesis. What we're trying to say here is that we can actually help you prove whether that hypothesis is right or wrong. 
what that means. And, and realistically, there's no wrong answer here. It is not about being wrong. It's about just changing the way that you perform your strategy based on what we can provide you. The other thing is you can send your communications on days that learning is popular. So on that previous slide, if I go back just to uh, this one here, we know that leadership, communication, relationship, management is really hot in this organization. So shall we send them more communications around those topics? Or do we want to send them something that doesn't focus on leadership just because we think that leadership's good enough? People already have a self-driven idea of what they want to learn. Identify skills where you don't have the right content. And like I say, lots of providers that we work with or lots of clients that we work with have lots of content. How do you know what's the right fit for your organization? And then work with HR to uncover why the popular times or why the popular skills are there. We work with one uh, organization in, in Amsterdam and they assumed, because they're an event business, that Friday was always going to be their best day for learning. Because you've hopefully, from Monday to Thursday, done loads of work, you've delivered your event, you've gone to the client, you've put all your stands up and it's like, great, we're ready for the weekend, let's go. Realistically, Tuesday was the biggest day that people wanted to learn. We talked to HR, we talked to some MDs around the business, we tried to understand why. And if you think about it, Monday is always horrible for everyone. You have your kickoff meetings, your strategy meetings, you're catching up with emails on the weekend. Tuesday was when the, the team there was able to go, I'm gonna save 90 minutes or an hour to actually try and think about what I am doing this week and how there is learning content that can help me get there. And that was something that we uncovered very quickly. We could go and do focus groups with learners to identify why people are actually learning on specific days. Is there something we can harness? Or is it a behavior that we want to stop? Are people doing too much learning? Which was a worry of a client we spoke to yesterday. Or a client's not learning enough. It's a nice problem to have. People are doing too much learning. There's a checklist for success. Um, and we've we work with 25 to 30 clients, and over that time, we've started to develop a way that we think we can help you be more successful. I'm pretty sure if you were to take this checklist and go to another provider, it would work exactly the same. So this is our gift to you. Um, so one of the things is a wide company initiative. So again, that positioning to the organization of why people should care about your new piece of content, your new learning initiative, is it that we need to be more innovative? Is it that the NHS in 2020 is supposed to be paperless? Is that something we need to educate people around? There's a few laughs there on that moment. Um, is it that we are so far behind our competitors when it comes to being digital and our digital transformation that we are losing sales to them? Is there something that we can actually position what we are doing to a wider business and make them care? This is the, uh, the big one. You can define success metrics. So yes, engagement, if we're getting people to learn more, Fantastic, big tick from everyone in the business. Hopefully people are learning. But what does that actually mean? If people learn, is there a behavior in the business that can actually be attributed to some financial cost? For example, sales is always the really easy example of if, if Rob goes in and does some more sales training, he sells some more things, is there a benefit of that that we can align that to? That's very easy to prove in my opinion. What's more exciting to try and prove is do we have any studies around why people leave the business? Generally, people leave the business because their manager is a bit of an ass, or they don't align with the vision. So can we develop some training? Can we help those managers to become better managers to retain people? Hiring people costs a fortune. You have recruiters, you have retention costs, you have knowledge gaps. So how can we retain the best people? Is there a connection to being a good manager? How can we help that manager learn more? And do we, are we able to look at Rob's team or someone else's team and say, Rob isn't a good manager because five of his staff have left in the last year. What is different between this manager and the other manager and is learning part of that? And what we're finding from initial conversation with clients is the more people learn, the more growth mindset they have, the more engaging they are in learning, the perception of them as a manager is a lot more higher. So what we can then tie that to eventually with a little bit more data is that yes, if people learn, they are generally better managers. If they're better managers, then the retention of their team is a lot higher. What that means is that person is saving the business hundreds of thousands of pounds a year, depending on how many people they manage. 
You have a C-level sponsor, this is the dream for everyone. The CEO actually cares about what you're doing or someone in a chief level executive is able to come in and say, yes, this is the thing. You get her to do a video for you. You get her to talk about why people should really care. But it is really important. It doesn't have to be C-level. It has to be an influencer. So whether that is someone that is ahead of a department or that is a C-level exec or a director, whatever management role you have in your business, you have to have someone that's really going to champion this and say, this is the thing that we need to do. This is the other one that I think um, when it talks about like giving LND a voice is we ha are able to communicate with people regularly. So we know that people, if we set them to their own devices generally, you have people that will learn that are curious. You also have people that aren't curious and don't want to learn or either don't have enough time. So how can we communicate with them to move them into curiosity and move them into those super users that are learning more often? Email we talked about, but Yammer, Slack, Teams, if you have a learning community, we find it works very, very well to be able to share resources and say, hey, I have learned this. Do you want to learn it? We have a Slack channel um, at, uh, I was going to say Magpie, at Filtered. Um, we, have, we use Slack, so anyone that doesn't know what Slack is, it's very similar to Yammer or Teams. It's just a social communication platform. We have a dedicated channel to learning. Um, I would say that someone shares something every two days. So it's not rampant. There's only 35 of us, so, you know, but someone coming in. But what we have done is we've set a framework of why you should post something in there. So not just, hey, I learned this, go and check it out. You have to have something in there of why that is relevant to someone. So I've got colleagues at the back of the room. They're in the creative team. Maybe there's something that I saw on branding or guidelines that I just saw on search in the net that would be specific for them. So we have some guidelines to say who this is relevant for, what it is, and why it is important to them. So it could be there's an asset saying, here's the trends of 2020, flat design or whatever. You can see that they've done a great job branding this. But maybe there's something here that we can relate to different parts of the team and then talk about that. What that happens, although there's only two, I would say, or one or two articles shared each other day, the threads on those then and the communication around those learning assets drive so much more engagement into those learning, learning sort of resources or those situations. It's just really, really powerful for us to be able to say, this is a hive of action. And hopefully we've made it very clear here that the, the learning analytics that Magpie generates um, is going to improve the learning experience and save you money. I've just looked at the time. I think I'm running slightly over, so I'm very sorry. So this is my last slide. Um, but this is our checklist of success. If anyone wants to talk about this, of how we can apply it to your provider, how you can provide it to us, hopefully, would be the, the real solution. Um, please do come and find me. We'll be at stand one, which is just around the corner. Um, most importantly, as I've been told by our marketing team, make sure we say that join us for a drink, um, 3 p.m., stand one, which is, again, just around the corner. Um, we do it all the time. And if you have any questions, my name's Rob. Um, I work at a business called Filtered, Rob at Filtered. Very easy. There's not many of us. So there's only one Rob. Um, and if anyone does have any questions, I'll sort of kick around and just come and grab me afterwards. But thank you for your time.